This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Now, I'll say what I just said again very quickly, shortly. But I have to say, because otherwise, why are there two ways? It all seems stupid, you know? But I'll tell you how to spot in the exam and so on. But as you'll see, there's another way to deal with it. Um, the problem we're talking about is when you're using gearing to finance a project. Okay? All right, well, before I come to that, I need to, it's very brief this, but I need to say a little bit about Medigliani and Miller. Chapter 11, page 53. Yeah. Instead, the chapter I've jumped over, this kind of cash flow techniques, is almost entirely a reprint of what you have at F9. It's going through how we set up the cash flows, deal with inflation, deal with tax. All right? Mm -hmm. There's one tiny extra thing, I'll mention that separately, but essentially that's just pure revision. However, I want to stick with financing. Uh, as I said, it was uh, Mr. Medigliani and Mr. Miller, two gentlemen from America, who did all the work on the effect uh, of gearing, of raising money in different ways. A lot of theoretical work, but they really led the... F well, they were the leaders in financial management. They started everything going. Um, now, when we did F9, it was pure discussion and I drew some little graphs and things. All of that really is now irrelevant. What's important is this. I'll write the core thing down in one moment. But they investigated and they said... If a company increases its gearing, it creates more risk for shareholders, and so shareholders will want a higher return. All right? But on the other hand, if you're increasing your gearing, debt borrowing is going to be cheaper, and so you're bringing in more and more cheap money. And they came to the conclusion that the net effect was this, and I'll draw one graph. You don't need the graph for the exam unless you're ever trying to explain and it helps you. But they said, if we looked at the cost of money as against the level of gearing, so here is when there's no gearing, when it's all equity, as you go up the axis, there's more and more gearing. You're understanding me here? They said, and they proved, all right, you know, they made lots of assumptions, but they actually proved that as far as the cost of equity is concerned, as I've been saying all day, as you have more gearing in a company, there's more risk, the cost of equity will go up. The cost of equity, maybe if you're all equity financed, it's, I don't know, 15% or something. But whatever it is, as you introduce more gearing, the cost of equity will increase Now, conventionally, we draw a straight line. It actually depends how you define gearing, but I don't, it's irrelevant. I don't care. All that matters, and I think it's common sense, is that the cost of equity is going to increase with high gearing because there's more risk to shareholders. You agree? As far as the cost of debt's concerned, you'd always expect debt to be cheaper. All right? Because, well, in theory, debt's risk-free. Lenders will demand a much lower return. Equity, even without gearing, there's risk, you know, the risk of the business. So you would expect debt to be cheaper. And, now I'm going to draw two lines in two colours. They did say, when they first did all the work, they ignored the effect of tax completely. And they said, OK, debt will be cheaper... 
Maybe that's the cost of debt. You know, maybe debt only costs 10% or something. I'm making up figures. But when they came to put the two together, they said, as you bring in more and more cheap debt, your weighted average cost of capital, of course, if you're all equity, your weighted average is the cost of equity, true? But they said, well, as you bring in more and more cheap debt, more and more cheap debt is pulling down your weighted average cost, you, you would agree? But the equity is costing more, and that's pushing up the weighted average. But they found that if you ignore tax, the two effects cancelled out. They said in the absence of tax, the weighted average cost of capital stayed constant. Now, you're not going to be examined on that, but it's the lead-in. They said that with no tax... The weighted average cost of capital remains constant. But again, the cheap debt cancels out the higher cost of equity. I think you understand what I'm getting at. The weighted average cost of capital stayed constant. Uh, and if it does, of course, it's irrelevant how you raise finance. All right? Now, although that's a fact, at a P4, I'm much less worried about that or less interested because that clearly isn't practical, the risk tax. But what is so much more important is that when they carried on and brought tax into it, and it's almost too obvious, I said exactly the same on F9, in fact, this bit, that if you'll accept what I've just said, do you all accept in principle what I've just said? Well, you know, you've got more and more cheap debt, which is making the wage average lower. But the cost of equity is going higher and higher, which is making the wage average higher. The two effects cancel out, yeah? Well, that picture is without tax, but if you bring in tax, the only effect of tax is to make the debt cheaper still. You know, equity doesn't get any tax relief, so if you're paying 15%, you're still paying 15% sort of thing. But because debt gets tax relief, the cost of debt to the company will be a lot lower. You'd all agree. And in theory, sorry, I didn't mention, but in theory, uh, since it's risk-free, you know, it doesn't matter what the gearing is, the cost of debt, yeah, should be more or less constant. But think about this for a minute. Sorry, cost of equity won't change because it's not tax allowable. But I said before, without tax, the extra cost of equity cancelled out by the cheapness of the debt. But if you make debt even cheaper, because it gets tax relief, surely the, the cheapness now of the debt is going to more than cancel the extra cost of equity, if you understand me. And they proved that as a result, the weighted average cost of capital will fall with higher gearing. Now, I could carry on chatting about that for hours. I'm not going to because, quite frankly, he won't expect you to chat about that for hours. You know, if you want to argue or it doesn't make sense, by all means do, obviously. But otherwise, make sure you are clear, though, that with tax, the weighted average cost of capital will fall with higher gearing.
All right, we accept that. But what is terribly important because of the numbers that are coming, the numbers are easy, but because of the numbers that are coming, the only reason extra gearing means lower weighted average, the only reason is because of the tax relief on debt. Now you see why that's so important shortly. When I go into Medigliani and Miller, more debt finance is attractive. Your weighted average will fall the more debt there is. All right? And fairly obviously, if it's true, the company should raise more and more debt finance. You know, if they're able. But the only, only reason is because of tax relief. There's no other reason at all. Uh, it's what we call that the tax shield. I'm not really bothered, you wouldn't touch on the word. But there's no other reason. If debt wasn't getting tax relief, there'd be no attraction at all. You know, they say, oh, debt borrowing might look attractive, the interest rates are very low. But they say, well, there'd be no benefit at all, because, you know, you may be paying low interest, but you'll be paying a lot more to shareholders. Yeah? No net effect. The only thing that makes debt attractive is it gets tax relief, and equity doesn't. Okay? All right, well, whether you remember that or not... Uh, for F9, all you could be asked to do was talk about it. But at P4, it goes one bit further. Because, although they made various assumptions, which I'll mention later, not only did Medigli well, Medigliani Miller did prove what I just said, but the way they proved it uh, the proof itself is irrelevant. If you want the proof, you'll have to see me later. It's... Actually, the proof is really funny. Did I tell you this before? The... Medigliano and Miller came up with a proof. And it was in the... Something like the Harvard Business Review or something. One of those things. They came up with a proof. And, it, you know, there was... it was a sensation. But in the next edition, two other people called Heinz and Sprenkel said Medigliani's proof was very interesting, but it was wrong. And they proved it a different way, but came to the same answer. And in the next edition, Medigliani and Miller thanked Heinz and Sprenkel for their work, but said their proof was wrong, and they proved it a third way. Now, in fact, all three proofs were almost the same. I couldn't quite see what the fuss was about. Uh, but it was sort of proved three ways. But what they did, you see, they set out, forgive me, I'm nearly there, they set out to look at the effect on the cost of equity of gearing. You know, everybody accepts, always accepts, it's common sense, that if there's more gearing, there's more risk, they'll want a higher return. Okay? But, until Medigliani and Miller, we said, oh, they'll want more, but you know, it might look like that, it might look like that, it could be anything. They said, well, assuming various things like we've got sensible shareholders, they worked out precisely how the cost of equity should move for higher gearing. You know, because it's something we can measure. You can measure gearing. You know, it's either 20% debt or it's 30% debt. And they said, well, because we can measure it, we should be able to write a formula for how the cost of equity would change. And they came up for a f for, with a formula that told us what shareholders required return would be for any level of gearing. Okay? And in fact, they came up with lots of formulae. You don't need them all. But they came up for a formula for cost of equity. Well, of course, if you've got a formula for cost of equity, you could come up with a formula for weighted average, you know. They did all sorts of theoretical work. Well, I'll say later, they obviously did make various assumptions and proving it's outside the syllabus. 
But the formula they came up with, again, is on your formula sheet, and I've typed it on page 53. Do you see that formula there towards the bottom? Now, I've defined the symbols there, so I won't write it all on the screen. But KE, the figure on the left, is saying the cost of equity of a company with gearing, that we can predict or calculate what will happen to the cost of equity for any level of gearing. It's always going to be KEI. KEI is the cost of equity if there's no gearing. All right? Plus, again in a sense a premium, the more gearing there is in the company, the more extra the cost of equity will be. You with me here? And the extra... Or you can see for yourself, it's 1 minus T, T is the tax rate, times cost of equity minus the pre-tax cost of debt, KD, times VD over VE, where that's the gearing ratio. Well, like everything, you can sit and stare at it all day. It is only playing with numbers. Using it's easy, but it's just making sure... I always, it always annoys me. Why do they give a formula sheet and not tell you what the symbols mean? The work really is learning the symbols. So rather than go backwards and forwards over the page, KE equals KEI, let's just illustrate it, plus 1 minus T, KE minus KD, VD over VE. And to illustrate it, can you look, please, at page 54, example 1. And I've just realised, I think I have a typing error here. Yes, I have. Yeah. Um, hello. Hello. There's a typing error. That's set in K, you should be KEI. You can't calculate something by using something at the other side. All right, let me show you how it works. Uh, the, I say there are two. Uh, well, I did say. In fact, you probably didn't hear. There are only two things you really need here. The first, you could be asked to use this formula. It's actually less likely. What's more likely is the second thing. But you could be asked to use it. It's on the sheet, so just make sure you could. Look at example one. London is an ungeared company with a cost of equity of 15%. They propose raising debt at 8% pre-tax, and the resulting gearing ratio will be 0.4. So we're going to end up with 40% debt, 60% equity. The corporation tax rate is 30%. Well, I know it's a long day, you may be getting tired. But if we're going to raise all this debt, you'd all agree the cost of equity we would expect to increase because there's more risk. Would you? And so they have asked us to work out what will happen to the cost of equity. Well, uh, we use that formula. The cost of equity... You tell me the figures... I'm not being rude, but come on. It's your turn to open your mouths. It's the cost of equity if there's no gearing. What's the cost of equity if there's no gearing? It's 15. I think fairly obviously it's going to be higher than 15. We said that, but the question is how much higher? Well, it's 1 minus the tax rate. I'll do that bit. The tax rate is 30%, so 1 minus is 70% or 0.7. Mm -hmm. Times... KEI minus KD. Well, KEI is the cost of equity of no gearing, which is 15. What's KD? It's the pre-tax cost of debt. It's before any tax relief. It's the return the investor wants. What is the cost of debt before tax? Eight. And again, sorry... 
keep talking, but pause for a minute. If there's no, um, if you've got debt where in theory there's no risk, shall the investors want eight percent? If you've got, if you invest in equity, well, even without gearing, you want more than eight. You would agree? There's the risk of the business. Well, the extra seven. Uh, anyway, it's that times that times the ratio market values debt to equity. And again, if you had a balance sheet, you'd use the actual market values. But here I've given you the ratio debt to equity is 0.4. And therefore, if you'll check my arithmetic, I think plus 1.96. The cost of equity would be 16.96. You agree? Now again, it's just formula, 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 but I hope we all agree. I'm, I expected it to be higher. It must be higher. The more gearing, the uh, bigger risk to shareholders, the more return they want. You do all agree? Incidentally, Hello, hello, hello. Just listen for a minute. Although he can ask that, he can't, you know, if he puts a formula on the formula sheet, obviously there's a chance sometime he'll ask it. The reason that's actually unlikely is that you could have done that another way. Didn't we have a formula that tells us if we know the beta without gearing, if we know the gearing, we can work out the beta with gearing. You know, we were doing that only a few minutes ago. I know I haven't given you the market return here. It actually wouldn't matter. You could make up one. But if we knew the market return... You could have worked out the beta. You could have used the gearing beta formula. You'd have come to exactly the same answer. Because that other formula was based on this one. All right? Mm -hmm. You know, and if it's relevant in the exam, almost certainly it'll be what we did earlier. You'll know the betas. You'll gear the beta. And you'll do what we did before. The chance of him asking this bit is actually, I think, very small. All right? However, as I say, because the formula's on this sheet, I've got to show you. I, I hope you'd agree. It's, it's easy to use, yeah? It also says, though, here, it says, well, I'm to the cost of equity. Well, it was 15. It goes to um, 16.96. It also, though, wants to know the weighted average before and after raising the debt. Will somebody tell me, please, before raising the debt, what's the weighted average cost of capital? Oh, well done. Sorry, I was hoping. No, I know what it likes. That is like when it gets half past four, you know. <laughs> Even obvious bits. Because, yeah. uh, no, currently you're all equity financed. So, if you're all equity, it's the cost of equity, it's 15. What about after we've raised the finance, though? Well, of course, we've now got equity and debt. The cost of equity we've just calculated is 16.96. What's the cost of debt, please? Good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you assume the debt is risk-free. Uh, well, it doesn't matter whether it is or it isn't, to be honest, does it? Uh, the debt is 8% pre-tax. You assume that the debt gets tax relief here at 30%. The cost of debt is 5.6%. And therefore, what happens to the weighted average? Now, uh, the gearing ratio. Well, I've written it up before, but be careful. Remember, it's debt to equity. 
So if equity is 100, debt is 40, the total is 140. Yep. And so the weighted average You better check me, I'm getting sleepy. Is it 13.76%? Is that right? Thirteen, twelve point one one plus 1.6. Oh. Who said yes when I said is that right? Is that better? Mm -hmm. like, who cares about 0.05%? You do it to the nearest percent anyway. That's, that's all. all right. And again, although I don't, I'm not suggesting that actually proves anything, but the point was, because they'd come up with that formula of how the cost of equity would change, you can see for yourself, the end result is the weighted average fell all right? And try any figures you like if you're not prepared to accept it. But as you add more and more gearing, you know, try it at home, it clinch yourself, but as you have more and more gearing, the cost of equity will be higher and higher, the weighted average will get lower and lower. All right? Also, incidentally, but it's up to you, I find these things fascinating, but I know you've got jobs to do. Although, you will only ever be dealing with a situation where there is tax, you know, real life. If the rate of tax was zero, if we ignore tax, yeah, it's so a tax zero, the formula still works. I'm not gonna, I really am not going to waste your time, but it is quite fun. You have a try if you don't believe me. But it'd be exactly the same formula, but of course if tax is zero, you know, one minus t is one, if you understand me, that disappears, yeah? But you have a go sometime. Do the same question with taxes zero. And you will find higher gearing. The way the cost of equity will be higher. Yeah? Hello? The cost of debt obviously will be 8% if there was no tax relief. You have a go. You'll find the weighted average cost of capital stays exactly the same. Try any numbers you want. Okay? So there's no tax... It stays unchanged. With tax, though, it does fall. And the only reason the weighted average falls, the only reason, is because of the tax relief. Okay? All right. Now, I've said the reason I did that was simply because it's on the formula sheet. I don't think he'd ask it. It's a little bit playing with numbers, quite frankly. But the other relevance of this chapter, and this certainly can be asked, is adjusted present value.